Well, aloha. Uh, no, aloha. Aloha. Y'all were just came from Hawaii, didn't you? How did it turn out? Pretty well. Well, listen. Let me let me uh, first of all saying uh, I apologize for making you stand out here on the first hot day y'all had this summer, but uh, and so I'll keep it kind of short. Uh, but it did occur to me that after you finished your really superb eight-month deployment, that I owed it to you to come by as a PACOM commander and to thank you for what you and what you and your families and your children and the sacrifices that you make to be able to continue to support the, this great nation that we live in. Your deployment uh, was marked by a lot of changes uh, in the world. As you know, over the last year or so, we've seen a change in the Middle East, a change in Syria, a change in Afghanistan where we're ramping down. We've seen just recently the Russians to basically take over Crimea without a without a whipper being made. But in my part of the world, our part of the world, because you, this this Marine Corps on this side of the world owns the Pacific, and it is really has a such an amazing history of Marine excellence in the Asian Pacific. And I'm really happy to have the Marines coming back and doing the things that Marines do better than anybody else in the world. And that's amphibious operations in the maritime littorals. So why is that important? Well, at PACOM, the area that I take care of for the president, which you do the work and I just think about it, is 52% of the world. In that 52% of the world, 17% of it is land. 83% water. Of the 17 percent land, six out of every ten people in the world today, in which there's seven billion people, live on that 17 percent of the land. Before your lives are over, there'll be nine billion people in the world, and seven out of ten of them will live in that 17 percent of the world, of the land. Now why is the water important? Because the global economy, what supports our nation, what makes us a great nation is not only what we do in America. It's not just about good football and good basketball and good baseball and having good business here in our country. We are a global country. Our economy and the future, your future, and our children's future require on us remaining a global power and being dominant in the security environment. So in my 52% of the world, our 52%, the Marine Corps, as they are operationally designed to deploy as MEVs and MEVs and MUs, who just came back as a successful MU, uh, are a dominant force in ensuring that America's rights and privileges are respected in my 52% of the world. So what kind of challenges did you face over there? You know what they were. Long days at sea, long time between Liberty ports, eight months gone, poor email service, all those things that, that frustrated me as a young sailor and as a young officer. Uh, the same things that probably occurred to you. But what happened over there was that the period of time you there, we went through several challenges. One was natural disasters. And you say, well, why do we spend all this time worrying about helping people with natural disasters in the Asia Pacific? You don't have many up here in San Diego, right? In the part of the world that you focus on, 80% of all natural disasters will occur in that part of the world. And the ability for it to influence billions of people, billions of people, in a way that disrupts the security environment can't really be understated. So you're you and, and some of your compatriots out there in the 31st view went through the operation in the Philippines. And because of the training of the United States Marine Corps, hear my, hear my again, not the you know, joint force, but the United States Marine Corps, in conjunction with the Navy Marine Corps team, were able to do really unimaginable things in helping uh, save the lives of thousands of people in the Philippines. So that's the first challenge, the natural disaster. The second challenge is trying to get all these countries that are there brought into the 21st century and get their militaries designed to not just focus on patrolling their people, 
but be able to have their militaries help with their commerce and help securing the maritime commons or the waterways around their countries where increasingly there's oil and there's fish and there's minerals on the bottom of the ocean. So that's where you get into this maritime uh, security cooperation stuff and helping build capacity among other nations. And y'all did that magnificently when you were there. And there's their higher end threats. It's the Korea threat, which is probably the most dangerous thing in our world today. It's a 31 year old crackpot that has nuclear weapons, okay? He has it. Everybody talks around that, but he has it. The question is, does he have the ability to deliver them in a way that can influence even our own country here? So he's not going away, doesn't appear to me, and we gotta be ready to deal with it. So you just did the largest combined amphibious operation we've done in Korea in two or three decades, I think, in Yongsong, right? And I understand that you guys perform magnificently as the aviation side of that operation. Is that correct? So that did not go unnoticed. It did not go unnoticed by the North Koreans. It did not go unnoticed by the South Koreans because they were in it with you. It did not go unnoticed by China. So how do we feel about China? Well, almost every big screen TV or, or thing you have in your house is somehow or another connected to our economy as a way it's connected to China. China is not going to go away. It is not going to retreat into its own self, we hope, because a failed China would be a catastrophe for the United States. But as China grows, how do we deal with them? And how do we help manage them so that they're productive members of the security environment rather than distract 